We live in a democracy and we should be able to discuss everything openly. This is one of our guiding principles and another reason why we as the Swiss health television company QS24 want to share other perspectives with you that may not always match normal medicine. Due to a new regulation by YouTube, it might now be the case that some of the very polarizing videos are deleted from time to time. On our website, qs24.tv, under the heading Censorship Videos, we will continue to make them available to you, because QS24 stands for Democracy and Freedom of Opinion. Welcome back, dear viewers, to our series, Natural Medicine. Today, I'm full of gratitude and happiness, because Hans Rausch is back with us again. He's a biologist, he's a chemist, he is much more. And I'd like to tell you about that in advance, or read it out quickly in case you hear him for the first time today. He's visiting professor at the TCM University in China. He's a long-time lecturer at the University of Applied Sciences in Germany, in Isni. He's one of the most recognized scientists in the world, especially in China and Japan. He establishes the gold standard, so the units of measurement for over 3,000 substances that are, of course, also used by pharmaceutical companies today. Of course, all the authorities know him too. He's deputy federal chairman at the German Standardization Institute. We Swiss know this under the DIN standard. He's an officially recognized expert in pharmaceutical law and also a counter-expert in legal disputes. And he's back today, Hans Rausch. A warm welcome here with us. Greetings, and I am pleased that we can discuss interesting topics again today. With pleasure. The last two episodes that I was able to make about the disinfectant and about valerian were already very interesting, and I know it continues today. I want to talk to you about aloe vera and magnesium. And please, let us start with aloe vera. We all know how valuable this plant is and how effective it should be. And you told me last night while eating raclette, wait, stop, not always. Well, as we discussed in the last episode with the valerian, it's not just the fact that a plant should be effective, that, at the, that it at the same time guarantees that the product that someone purchases somewhere also brings with it the expected effect. Mm -hmm. So, of course, we have to think of certain things. We briefly discussed the last time, it depends on if it is the right plant. This is also a very critical point with aloe vera. Mm -hmm. According to official information, if you look at world market figures for aloe vera products, there isn't as much aloe vera in the world as there are products in circulation each year. So the question arises if everything that says aloe vera has ever been brought past the aloe vera, let alone really has the ingredients of aloe vera in it. So that's a first critical point. Aloe vera, is there really aloe vera in it, or any other type of aloe? There are many types of aloe, the effectiveness of which has partly been proven, partly not even been investigated at all, but must of course serve as a source for some products. This means that, in addition to the right plant material, the appropriate, correct plant part also plays a role. Well, with aloe vera, it's not a problem because you basically use the leaves, if you like to call them that. It's more like a a prickly cactus or something. Yes, a, a succulent plant in the biological sense. So water storage inside, and that's exactly what the pharmacology, so to speak, has always liked to use. So the experience, and I also mentioned it yesterday evening, if I get burnt in the kitchen and there is an aloe vera plant next to me, then I break off a leaf and squeeze this juice, this gel inside this leaf onto the burn. 
and can actually prevent the development of blistering in the vast majority of cases. So that means the effectiveness of aloe vera, for example on burns, is guaranteed. With many other applications, you don't even know what is supposed to work. In the meantime, of course, there is a, a certain ecological and economic hype around such plants. On the one hand, a renewable raw material, on the other hand, something that has a positive image in the market. And then new products are generated without really ever having provided evidence as to whether the substance really works or not or whether it's more of wishful thinking, a placebo effect or not. The main problem with the ingredients in aloe vera, this gel we just talked about, this gel is not stable per se. And I, I don't know any process and I'm a lecturer in pharmaceutical technology myself. How you can make something available, process it technically, with which you could preserve this gel in intact form. That means once it's taken from the plant, we have degenerative processes that change the material so much that it actually, uh, to be precise, loses its effectiveness. So aloe vera and stabilizing effectiveness is an issue with which specialists have already been dealing with for many years and I am not aware of real uh, proven procedural optimizations. Does that mean these products that are on the market, some of which also have an effect, but the effect does not come from the aloe vera, but maybe from other ingredients? Possibly. Certainly not from the aloe vera. Well, we can't say for sure, we can't rule it out, but definitely the effect of the fresh plant is far different from what really gets into the product. So like an omega-3 that is rancid, it no longer has, it is still omega-3, but it no longer works, does it? Yes, something like that. However, stories with the omega-3, if we want to just go into that briefly, it's actually a, a political hype and nothing really... Or I have to put it another way. Clinical studies have shown that only in children up to their sixth year, omega-3 fatty acids have some biological effect in the body. In adult humans, pharmacologically seen, the intake of omega-3 fatty acids is actually not mandatory. Really? Fact. But I also have the feeling that I've heard people, for example, who have taken omega-3 for eye problems and they themselves said it improved. The eyes, the eyesight is better. Imagination? Why? Why imagination? Why are we always so monocausal and say, I put a coin in the parking meter and the clock moves? That's not how the human body works. Much more complex mechanisms take place in our organism. That means that repair mechanisms are not only monocausal, I press a button and something gets triggered. Repair mechanisms, as well as neural decisions, such as visual acuity, may it be organic damage or organic changes or neural changes that the optic nerve does not work properly. I don't know where there should be an approach. Such things are described, it improves. That is a subjective story, maybe sometimes even measurably better, but whether this has been the result of this trigger or of completely different effects has never been proven. But now I've always heard that there are very, very many scientific studies on omega-3 nowadays. Yeah. What kind of studies are those that I hear about? Are they not recognized? Are these, well, of course, you always have to differentiate between a medical study and a clinical study. I also have to add one thing. 
There is actually, scientifically speaking, not a single sensible study that proves the effectiveness of artificially added vitamins for the human organism. All commercial companies refer to a clinical study which scientific content is more than doubted by all professionals. And of course, I have to add something else. Why is the requirement for vitamins regulated individually in every country? <laughs> you, you could be really nasty and compare the values of the gross national product of the individual country to the amount of vitamins required recommended by the state commissions. And you will find that in countries with a low gross national product, the requirement for vitamins, although they're also Europeans, is lower. Why is that? Is it because the human is different, is genetically different? Or is it really because, again, who can I convince to buy more? So very random, the whole thing. It's very random. And I've always said one thing, that many times in nutritional science, it is argued with half knowledge. And if you were to summarize everything really critically, you would have to say that now, for example, in terms of eating habits in England, life expectancy should be years lower than in the rest of Europe. However, we don't see this effect. So, is the English person any different from the continental one? that they can then better tolerate this, according to our criteria, malnutrition. I'd like to leave it at that, unanswered. There is a lot of complaint about it, and there is little well-founded work. Thank you. I'd like to bridge the gap to last night, when we briefly talked about magnesium, because I said, yes, if you have cramps, you should also take magnesium. You say, this is a placebo. Magnesium is now considered a placebo in the professional world, because the original connections between magnesium and the development of cramps, or rather, lack of magnesium and the development of cramps, are in no way understandable. I personally, actually because of my, uh, let's say, closer insights into Asian medicine, actually stumbled upon it in Asia, that nobody discusses cramps there, because everyone in all of the countries uses a very simple herbal mixture to relieve both muscle cramps as well as nervous, so neural cramps. And there it becomes more interesting, because in the... West, we have almost nothing in that direction, with a simple herbal mixture of two plants that we also know in the West, because we have used them for us, I would say, for almost centuries. You, you can basically treat cramps with them very easily. This is not discussed in everyday life in Asia. With us, every athlete is taking magnesium. Magnesium is a mineral that, thank God, is discharged relatively quickly so that it will not lead to, let's say, poisoning in the body. But please, how does this come to this awareness that I also have, that I have learned, that doctors also prescribe? It's a placebo. It's a placebo and nothing else. So no scientific base? No. So all the studies that have now been carried out disprove the thesis that magnesium can intervene in the process of cramps. It's unbelievable what we are allowed to learn today and what I'm allowed to share. But, but now let's go to the solution, because there are people who have cramps and are blocked. And you have made me curious with these two substances, which are typically eaten or consumed in Asia. Yes, everyone is taking it, from toddlers to grandmothers, to solve such problems very quickly. It's a mixture made from licorice and peony roots. 
So, something that we actually know as a decorative plant in the front yard, but of course it also has a pharmacological effect. This pharmacological effect is absolutely unknown in Europe, but is known to every child in Asia. So, a mix of the two would easily treat cramps here as well. In such cases, I can only recommend using, let's say, convenient products. There is currently no finished product of this type that will only be in preparation sometime in the next few years. I'll probably also be involved, as I have heard. And in this respect, at this point in time, you can really only refer to using compounded granulate, asking a pharmacy to get a suitable mixture for you, and the problems are gone. A mix of, of licorice and the peony root. Yeah. Is that then ground into a powder? It is. Well, it's not powder because powders don't mix well. It's basically small grains, so granules, as it's called in technical Chinese. So powder pressed into granules, which can then be mixed, ideally, and then be taken in water, preferably dissolved in hot water and then drunk. And with that, the problems are actually gone. Can you tell me something about the dosage? Is that a 50-50 mix? That's a 50-50 mix. And then a teaspoon a day? That is then precisely determined by the pharmacist, as it depends on what strength they have, and then they define it on their packaging how you can then apply these things. Do you know why these two substances have an anticonvulsant effect in the... Uh, so the mechanisms of action are currently in development. So in the process of clarifying why and on which individual structures these attacks, these chemical attacks take place in the body, at the moment I can't simplify it yet. But the effect has been there for centuries. So this is a tradition that has been used in Southeast Asia for, oh, I would say, two and a half thousand years. Only in the West, it was never noticed. And I always say one thing, you don't have to reinvent the wheel when someone has a wheel that works better. Then why should I want to drive with a square? Now, there are also athletes who really go to their limits and then really have symptoms of cramps. Oh, well, they've always used the magnesium. So that would also be good advice for them. I think so. And these two products are not considered. They are known and don't act as a doping agent in any way, as a risk for a competitive athlete. So you could use it there immediately and use it successfully. So, with your knowledge as you sit there, and with all your knowledge that you have in this area, do you have to look at the whole world with a smiling eye sometimes? What we think and what we do? Yes. Every day, several times. And for me, it's so important today because, of course, I very often hear a different point of view. We talk a lot about natural medicine, we talk a lot about complementary medicine, to simply show a different perspective on academic medicine. And you're here today with all the knowledge behind you, what academic medicine actually has too, how pharmacy helps, how naturopathy helps. We're trying to bridge the gap. In many cases, Cases. Complementary medicine has the dilemma that it can't prove why something works, but knows that it does work. Empirical medicine, empirical medicine, and of course there's always the risk of being quickly discredited. We are trying to bridge exactly this gap in order to define evidence, finding evidence of why the effect is there, and that those effects are also rationally based, and are provable, and thus also the reputation of these applications in the public eye, then also improves accordingly. So, it has to be the goal. Actually, what I said before, to separate the wheat from the chaff. So, to not discredit products that are actually good because there are products that are not good. 
Und, eben, and wenn man rational if you work rationally und rational and create und rational foundations, therefore the public perception should also be affiliated with a positive impulse for such complementary approaches. So, once more, we've already talked about disinfectants. We talked about valerian, we talked about aloe vera. And I keep hearing that we should really get this at the pharmacy and not somehow on the market, because if it has an effect, it has to be pharmaceutically proven. Otherwise, there's nothing in it. Not necessarily nothing in it, but it, it can't be proven if something is in it. And the customer or user is, of course, in the dilemma. How are they able to orient themselves? Because the advertising promises that are made are very diverse. And with these stories, of course, the lawyers are often more preoccupied than the scientists who deal with the facts. It's more about what can I say without being legally in trouble if they're not able to present a scientific foundation at all. But if we as consumers wait another 20 or 30 years, all of the herbal medicine is off the table. Yes, but of course we also have problems that are discussed in public, which in turn are not rationally based. We have, for example, the celandine. Products with celandine ingredients are discredited, actually because of a, a wrong, and I'll say structural policy problem. There were some clever regulatory politicians, I'll, I'll just call them that, who defined at a time that an effective celandine supplement has to contain a certain minimum concentration of alkaloids. Alkaloids are usually substances that can be toxic, but also often show a good pharmacological effect. And through this wrong decision to increase the minimum proportion of alkaloids, although a concentration based on experience has always been used over centuries, it led to damage in users. And exactly this knowledge, although in the meantime all products have now lowered the alkaloid content again, but this knowledge that celandine alkaloids cause damage, that stays. That remains, because Paracelsius is no longer in your head. The dose makes the poison. If I use a dosage as it has been used for centuries, uncritical, and don't think I have to define in the ivory tower, I need more of it, then there is no damage. But if there is damage, it basically becomes a knockout criterion for an entire industry that actually does its job damn well. And is not to be blamed, because certain irregularities then create a negative image, which is transferred to the high-quality products. And that's such a problem where I say, I can't just take the knowledge of harm and simply transfer it across the board to everything. We know the dose makes the poison, but the dose also makes the therapeutic. So if I have too little in it, or if I have nothing in it, then it just doesn't work. If I have too much, I have toxic risks. This is the classic pharmacokinetics that you always look at these days. What is the minimum dose and what is the maximum dose? So I have to move in the corridor of the therapeutic broadness. I have to have a minimum concentration so that it works at all and never exceed a maximum concentration so that it doesn't do damage. But if I move solidly within this, I'll have a solid, safe, reliable and effective phytotherapeutic agent.
Yes, I understand. I always say knowledge matters. But this reverse sentence, not knowing doesn't matter, does not help anyone. Because what we should actually do is maintain what we have learned over centuries and what we can even scientifically prove today and not dilute it by mischief. And exactly this nonsense, on the one hand, to use non-pharmaceutical products where one doesn't know if it works or has evidence of these changes in dosage, if we do that for another 20 years, then the whole phytotherapy will disappear from the market because it's discredited. Yeah, because through, let's say, unqualified products, they're so discredited that nobody trusts the whole thing anymore. That was also the reason why the Chinese government was working on this with Japan and Korea and has taken countermeasures to define the quality level in order to avoid this malinformation with dietary supplements, which they, of course, have as well in a global world market system to be able to counteract. That's why this story that at the moment, well, at the moment is a bit of an understatement, for over 10 years, we have been trying hard through international standards to get the quality of Asian traditional medicine to a new level of quality, which in this form has so far only been achieved by a certain number of companies over there, and many also just followed these world market conditions make it cheap and sell as much of it as possible, and by that completely battered the reputation of traditional Asian medicine. So, according to statements of leading politicians, also in Asia, the trust of the middle class which makes up a large part of the purchasing power of their own traditional medicine, has been battered so much that there are now massive political countermeasures. You were hired by the authorities. No, not hired, but through the ISO in Geneva. A standardization is generated, basically a, a secretariat, a technical secretariat, that's TC249. So, Technical Committee 249, which deals with Asian traditional Asian medicine under the code name TCM, simply as a, an abbreviation, with exactly these questions, and will, in the future, define binding international standards, how the minimum quality can be defined, in order to be able to eliminate the abuse of ineffective, bad, even harmful products based on your gold standards that you establish. Yes, among other things. So that's why I'm accepted there accordingly, because units of measure are not political. So all countries know a statement, this is like this, has nothing to do with a political ideology or thinking, but solely with the verifiability, with the provability of a content. And on this solid base that we have cultivated in Europe for years and decades, we're now also trying to use basically the huge wealth of experience and access to components that we're not even familiar with in Europe or in the West that open up opportunities for us to treat diseases, which we don't have under control at the moment. I think that's the key word for the next episode, because that's exactly why we're digging in now. And that is the right key word for you, dear viewers. Please just watch again, subscribe to the YouTube channel, watch when Hans Rausch speaks again the next time, because now we're going into detail about what he just opened up, which is uh, forms of therapy that are already used as standard in China, in Wuhan, and here in the Western world, have not been heard about at all. So that will be very, very exciting. Thank you very much, dear Hans, for this episode. All the best to you, and see you next time.